Thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Everything Under the Sun, the AccuWeather podcast. I'm producer Andy Robb, joined in the studio by Director of Audio Services, Ken Prell. Ken, what's going on? Hey, how are you, Andy? Doing well. Regina Miller, uh, not here this week. She'll be back next week. Yep, she'll be back for next week's episode of the podcast. So this week, uh, we are talking to a pioneer in broadcasting, one of our very own. That's right. Uh, This week on the podcast, we have Elliot Abrams, our senior VP and chief forecaster here at AccuWeather, getting ready to retire. So after 50 years and also being AccuWeather's first employee, Elliot Abrams hanging it up. And he'll be sharing some behind-the-scenes stories of his time here at AccuWeather, how forecasting has changed, how radio has changed, um, so on. Whole bunch of good stories coming up with him. Chances are you grew up listening to him in some way, shape, or form. So our look back on Elliot Abrams' career is coming up. Well, we have the honor and privilege of being joined in the studio by, well, a legend in his field. Of course, uh, chief forecaster here at AccuWeather, Elliot Abrams, joining us in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad one of my relatives was able to get that speech to you. What, you you don't think you're a legend? Well, I'm soon to be a legend. (laughs) It means you're old, actually. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. No, it goes with all the respect. Oh, listen to this. How can you be a meteorologist, a weather forecaster, and get respect? I mean, what other profession can you be wrong 60% of the time? Oh, is that? No, that's baseball. (laughs) That gets you in the Hall of Fame. (laughs) That's right. Well, you're getting ready to, what, hang up the headphones, I guess, here soon? Uh, getting ready to retire after, what, over 50 years here at AccuWeather? Uh, 51 and a half, and, uh, you know, I've been a job hopper all this time. Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought I might try something else. <laughs> so let's take a look back at your career. Um, what was the year? When did you start here at AccuWeather? Well, Dr. Joel Myers, who is our president and founder, uh, came up to me in the weather tower at Penn State in 1967, I think it was October, and said, um, how'd you like to work for me? I'm hard to work for, but I'm fair. (laughs) And uh, he was right. It was part-time, and at the time, he was serving some ski areas and a couple of utility companies, and so it was just a a wintertime business. And we had a call, a number of ski areas, Joel called hundreds of them, and also towns, and the idea was we could actually help you save money. And as an example, there was one mountain in New York State, Hunter Mountain, where they'd get thousands of skiers every weekend. And they made snow. And snow making was a relatively new thing, but they were able to do it. But it was very temperature and, and humidity dependent. And so what we offered is an hourly temperature forecast for each night. And so let's say they're out there at 11 o'clock at night, it's drizzling, but they think, okay, it's only the middle of the night, it's going to get colder, we'll be able to make snow later tonight. Let's say they had a crew of six or eight people there. Well, we could tell them, no, it's not going to get cooler tonight, it's actually going to be the same temperature at six o'clock in the morning, you won't have been able to make a single bit of snow. If you knew that in advance, you could let the staff go home. I mean, you're, they're still on payroll, but if, if you're paying by the hour, uh, that's a lot of hours being saved. And so. We would save labor and and things like that by being able to specify the temperatures at these places and also give them uh, temperatures for the tops and bottoms of their mountains, which they hadn't been accustomed to getting. So that was a relatively new thing uh, for businesses back then. The whole idea of customizing a forecast for specific users, a lot of people didn't even think that was possible. You heard the weather forecast or you saw it on TV, and there were only a few sources of it. There were only a few TV stations in any given city and some radio stations, some just uh, would read the forecast, and it might have been yesterday's forecast or something, and and people not paying attention to it. And the National Weather Service at that time, uh, still called the U.S. Weather Bureau, but probably one of the the best federal agencies there there was and is, made forecasts, but a lot of people didn't pay attention. Well, speaking of radio, that's kind of what you're known for, uh, one of the co-founders of the radio line of business here at AccuWeather. How did that all come about? Well, we were interested in serving some radio stations, and I think one, one of them in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area called up Dr. Myers and asked if we provided that kind of service. And of course, since he was looking to expand, certainly we do, <laughs> and that was the first station, WARM, the mighty 590 in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton market. And, so we gave the forecast, and I talked to somebody there, Harry West, who was the morning person, and he was very funny, 
and uh, so we did some a little bit of shtick and also the forecast. I remember appearing in the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade in, uh, I guess, 1972 or three in, in uh, wilkes Suddenly a cheerleader comes up to me and opens up a coat like this, and I didn't know what was next, but anyway, they were just showing their how happy they were that I was there, and I'm thinking, I'm just the weather forecast. <laughs> <laughs> but I really realized what some of the radio public appearances were quite early. That was one of the questions that I had um, about, you know, when radio first started here at AccuWeather when you were heading that up. Um, were those forecasts just done by calling the radio station, and then they recorded that onto tape and then put it out onto the air? That's what they did. They called it, and m- many stations had their own recording people. So we recorded it, and... The engineers that had to, their art was being able to be friendly to you when actually they're quite upset that you were taking so many takes to get the same thing done. Like mm-hmm. if you if you go halfway through it, you had to redo it. There was no there was no real good editing and splicing. You had to actually physically splice tape together. It wasn't like we do like it's done now digitally, and which fortunately you'll be able to get rid of most of what we say right now <laughs> uh, before this actually is seen or or, or we're or, keeping or, it all. <laughs> uh, so. That's how you called it in, and so we actually wrote the scripts by hand. And then a few years later, we actually got some typewriters, and they were pretty noisy. So if you had 15 forecasters making it, it sounded like a quite a busy place yeah. making the forecast. When we first got computers, the difference with the, with the keyboards was huge. Yeah. Did you have to type them up yourself, or were there... Oh, yes. We we typed them, and then uh, we read them. And some of them were even archived. Uh, one that I wrote in the mid-1970s was my Turkey Day forecast for Thanksgiving, where I talked about the turkeys warming up in the oven to a high of 190 and then cold front of a knife slicing through the turkey and causing it to accumulate one to two inches on plates <laughs> and how there would be uh, mashed potatoes and, and uh, it would turn into green bean casserole, slippery spots on the plate, and uh, that later there'd be leftovers and, and lots of flurries of, of sandwiches. You know, you were always known for for your humor and and a unique brand of radio. When did you start to develop that as part of your profession? I'm not really sure. I know I was a weatherman in a class play in second grade. And some people used to give me a hard time when I was in the Boy Scouts if I predicted wrong for the weekend, which always happened. (laughs) And so uh, maybe it was a defense mechanism because the more I could talk in some humorous way about something that wasn't directly related to that forecast, the less time there was to actually realize the forecast might not be right. (laughs) And so it was entertaining at least. So always kind of leave them laughing a bit. Leave them laughing. But also, you also wanted to provide a service. I I always thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice to save somebody's life? Yeah. I actually got a call like that once in the late 70s at the station in York. Somebody called. They had this thing called travel weather Mm -hmm. every day at 9.15. And people would call in and say where they were going. And then the air person would ask us what's happening from Phoenix to Los Angeles or what's happening from uh, Atlanta to Miami. So one time I was talking with about something happening in the southwest part of the country. And I said that the days that they were going, there could be some significant storms or perhaps even some flooding of some of the dry gullies that were through there. And the person, when they got home, actually called WSBA up and said that they thought that I'd save their lives because they encountered one of these situations and avoided a particular route that they later found had been flooded and people were killed at that time. Wow. What, what, what did that, how did that make you feel? Well, I felt you know great for the moment, except we had to make the other forecast for the, for that day, which <laughs> might not be so great. But more recently, um, AES, one of our the division of AccuWeather, was able to save the, a train crew in Mexico when they realized that there'd be flooding. They actually told the train operators to uh, stop at a particular milepost, walk out ahead, and make sure the tracks were still there. And indeed, when they did that, the tracks were washed away. They'd have all been killed if that forecast hadn't been so accurate. And this was just recently. Well, as you look back on your career, is there a certain storm that uh, you remember forecasting or, or something behind the scenes that really stands out to you? Post-storm traumatic syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. Uh, Agnes in 1972. Because um, for one reason or another, uh, Dr. Myers is out of town. So there are just a couple of us there doing the radio broadcast. And WARM in Scranton, that our first customer, wanted us on the air every 15 minutes talking about the flooding. Now, in a way, it was easy because all you had to say was going to keep raining. 
and the flooding was going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. But every 15 minutes was something that we didn't generally do in addition to our other calls. Now today there are lots of live reports. But so being on there and, and hoping to be helping people, one of the things in the Agnes situation, we also had a construction company we were serving that was building two dams in central Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And we had advised them a few days before that if they valued their equipment, they would want to get it out of the lowlands before the storm came because the flood would wash away or, or ruin it. And they told us afterwards that we saved them millions of dollars just by wow. making that suggestion. But with that flood, in those days, the National Weather Service forecast of floods did not really incorporate additional rainfall that was going to be occurring. It was only the rainfall that had already fallen into a river basin. And so if it was going to be a long storm like Agnes was, a lot of that rain wouldn't be accounted for. And so the flood stage forecast, they had to estimate in some way. And then today they, they do it much in a much better fashion. But the natural river level, I think it was 22 feet for flooding. But if you saw a, a stage predicted of 26 feet, that, wasn't mean you, that didn't mean you go on the air talking about terrible flooding. There, they had dikes protecting Willis-Barry up to 38 feet. Now those were then s surpassed by the storm. The river came clear over that and flooded the whole downtown area. And so every 15 minutes we were talking about that situation unfolding. Do you, uh, and you still do currently, as of right now, as we're, as we're counting down your career, th there are still stations that you still do live appearances for, correct? That's right. Uh, Chicago, for example, on live each hour during the morning at uh, 13 minutes after the hour. And during storms, and this morning a storm is just winding down at the end of the network news, we have a short report about what's going to be happening, and then again at the bottom of the hour. And a number of stations do that, and we have uh, all our meteorologists are, are trained to be able to, to make it reports that are much shorter, for example, than this podcast, you may only have 20 or 30 seconds to talk and you have to explain what's going to happen so that people can make better plans for their day. Yeah, that's been one of the things that I think that you've probably seen uh, in your career on the radio side of things, everything getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So how do you go about getting out that the most uh, pertinent information, the most important information to the listeners when you have now a limited amount of time? You talk real fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> don't, talk, don't talk long. No, but has it been a challenge? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> we have all the time in the world to talk here on oh, the podcast. So you, okay. <laughs> we don't need to keep these to one-word answers. Well, then wasn't there a, a bit where they once did the slow talkers of America routine? <laughs> I don't they know. Did. It was old-time radio, and they said they talked slow <laughs> it, it went on you know all those things but yes uh, uh, the shortcuts and just sort of the, like the the live th thing you see on tv where somebody says a few words and hopefully it made sense when they were talking that's one of the questions that i wanted to ask because you know as we're all radio people here but for somebody that may not know um you as a forecaster as a broadcast personality when you have to get pertinent information out over a radio broadcast you only have a certain amount of time how do you uh, discriminate so to speak uh, the information what goes out and what doesn't go out or what makes it easiest for the listener we have to parse it the first thing I think about before doing anything in the morning is what does it feel like if I live in Chicago I'm there on State Street what is going to be what am I going to what's the wind like how, how cold does it feel or how warm does it feel is it raining or is it snowing and so what am I experiencing? And then try to relate that to starting at that point, telling a story about what's going to be happening next and what you might have to watch for in terms of changes. Like I'll sometimes say, if we're predicting, say, two to four inches of snow in the afternoon, I'll say, and in the what could go wrong department, if the storm slows down, suddenly it's six or eight inches. Now, I won't count that six or eight as being right, but enough people will have heard it that they know, okay, there might be a little more than they're saying here's the potential for what this can do. So, you know, take those extra steps, be a little bit more careful. In fact, a relatively new product that AccuWeather is a, a map that shows expected snow amounts. And we have this thing called the AccuWeather Storm Max. The accumulation might be expected to be three to six inches, but knowing the nature of the storm, maybe it gets much stronger than expected. What is the maximum we could conceive of it happening? And so the Storm Max might be 13 inches or so. We don't expect that. We're not predicting that at the time, but that tells you the limit of what seems possible with a storm of that size. 
Well, as you look back on forecasting, let's get away from radio here just a little bit. Um, obviously, a lot has changed in your 50-plus years here at AccuWeather. What's most notable? So many things. In those days, we actually didn't have personal computers. If you were, took CompSci in college, you wrote your code on these cards and then turned them into the computer operator, and they put those cards into the computer, and if you typed one thing wrong, spit it back out, it didn't produce anything for you. And the cards were sort of novelty. They also used, for example, when you would, uh, at Penn State, for example, when you would register for a, a particular gym class, like, say, bowling or, or softball or whatever, you had a, one of these cards, and that card would then have the information encoded on it. And I remember the person standing in front of the whole group saying, Students, do not pick your teeth with the cards. <laughs> do not bend, fold, spindle, or mutilate these cards. <laughs> these cards need to be read by the computer so we know which section you're going to. So do not fold, spind, or mutilate the cards. And people were probably doing that. Folding, spinning, and... <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but how much has uh, forecasting improved? It's really gotten a lot better. A forecast that we might have made for 24-hour period... Um, t today we can make one out for f sometimes four, five, six days that's that accurate. Unfortunately, there are some times when we're making a forecast for an hour from now mm -hmm. and we can't make that accurate. For, for example, when thunderstorms are developing and we believe there will be severe thunderstorms, but they're none in existence right now. What's the first lightning strike? We can't actually predict what that's going to be. Once we see the pattern of lightning, then we can make a forecast of it and we can see it almost instantaneously. That's the other thing that is so big now. You can see information from any, just about anywhere in the world almost instantaneously. Same with news. When, when George Washington won the Battle of Trenton in the early part of the Revolutionary War, they didn't find out about that in, in England until weeks later. The mm -hmm. information had to be written down by hand and taken over on a boat and then handed it out to the newspapers it wasn't like today where you'd have found out five minutes from, from now and they'd have live coverage of it. Everything took longer. Mm -hmm. And there are some good and bad effects of that. The one bad thing, unfortunately, is that people do, can do bad things that affect others much more quickly and, and disastrously than back in those days. In and, fact, and spread misinformation. That's right. Yeah. Fa fake news and hopefully mm -hmm. not fake weather. Yeah. <laughs> but I know with the, with the revolution, when the British evacuated Boston in uh, 1775, one of the illustrations of it is a painting someone made of the boats being loaded, getting ready to leave. In a war today, you couldn't have somebody sitting there make, rendering a painting. Just painting, <laughs> yeah. While all the bombs are raining. It's just, it's, it's just different. Do you feel like with the with how information is spread quickly, does that feel that you have a more of a responsibility to help improve your messaging, not just as a forecaster, but also as a broadcast personality? That's always very important, as you know, with broadcasting. You want to say specifically what's happening and get the information out in a way that most people can understand. That's extremely important for anybody doing broadcasting. You want to be understood and you want to get your facts straight first. And so you collect your information and then you talk. And sometimes you speculate about things. But uh, with weather information, there's so much happening around the world that you really have to be in tune with what's happening in each place that you're forecasting for. Mm -hmm. Is there snow? Is there ice? Is there fog? Is something changing very quickly? Is something different now than it's going to be? What's it going to be like when the kids get out of school? What's it going to be like for uh, soccer parents who are, want to go to a game, watch the game, or, or little league games? There are all these different things that people are doing. We want to be able to be relevant to them. The longevity of your career has been fascinating to me. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> You've ch chosen to spend your entire career here at AccuWeather. Why? Was there ever an opportunity to, to make a jump anywhere else? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, my first thought was to become a, a TV weather meteorologist, mm -hmm. and I actually was on Penn State's uh, weather world for about 30 years. It was like one week, at a t one week uh, every month or two. And in 1971, actually, a couple of years after I'd started working for, for Dr. Myers, uh, a station in Pittsburgh offered me a position of doing the weather at 6 and 11. Really? And one and on this particular day, uh, uh, Joel 
was upset about a forecast I'd made earlier in the day, and I said something like, well, if, if you don't like it, I can leave. He said, what do you mean? <laughs> and I told him exactly that. He said, what, really? And he took me to lunch that afternoon. Wow. And uh, that's when we decided that I was going to stay and be his associate. Wow. What are you going to miss the most about being here at AccuWeather? I'm going to miss the people I work with every morning. Um, many of them are just starting their careers. And I must say that the ones, the people that we've hired, say, in the last five or ten years, I think are, are better workers than ones we may have hired 10 or 15 years ago, even though they, the ones that are still here are great now. But they come with an attitude. They get to work. They want to learn as much as they can, and they want to be as productive as possible. And that's something a lot of people don't realize about today's people coming just out of college. Now, it's said that for that millennials and after always like to be praised, and you, you do want to try to be positive because you heard about that. Uh, that. That was the attitude before. And I know with our kids, we wanted to always give them encouragement and never tell them that they were bad. What they did might have been bad, but not that they were bad. And so that's something that we try to to do at AccuWeather in our training programs, encourage people to do better, let us know when, uh, if you have a particular interest in something that you're not doing now, uh, can I be scheduled for that? And we have a long history of hiring within for and, and giving people uh, different positions as they advance. And so I, I really like that aspect of it. But I, like, I really like the people I work with. There's a lot of people that have come into this place over the last few years. This place has grown quite a bit. Does it ever amaze you when you take a look around f compared to when you started here at AccuWeather to where it is now? Yeah, well, to be the first employee in yeah, LC, first, over 500, 500 employees. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it happens so gradually. It's kind of like quicksand, I guess, or, or a, a slow rising flood. I mean, it doesn't come on all at once and it just sort of happens. But I actually sent, believed at the beginning in talking with Dr. Myers that something like this might happen, that it might really expand. He was certain that this could be done. You don't meet that many people that have that kind of conviction and drive early on in, in your experience. People might have some ideas and might sound like wild ideas. Some might have good ideas. But uh, some of the people who built some of the greatest companies must have been that way. Tell me a little bit about that when when the very, very early on you said you, you, you were speaking with Dr. Myers, you had a good feeling about, you know, and you both were in agreement that this company could grow into something. How did all that come about when it was going through your mind? Well, I'd heard of some uh, called private weather services that existed back then. Some had formed right after World War II, and they made customized forecasts. But there was a general belief that this field really had a lot of opportunities that people didn't realize. I mean, could you really tell somebody, for example, who owned a bakery, uh, could you give them a forecast that would help them plan their runs of, say, hamburger and hot dog rolls on Friday mm -hmm. night and Saturday night? I mean, mm. such a thing. Could you make a forecast like that? Well, we actually did for a number of years for a bakery in Philadelphia. Uh, they told us, first, you find out what their needs are. And this company said, well, we found in the past that if it rains on Friday night, People don't buy hamburger and hot dog rolls because they sort of suspect it might be a wet weekend and they may not barbecue that weekend. They might not put on the grill. But if it's dry on Friday night in the summer, that's a good, they feel good about that. It's dry out, we're going to have a picnic or, or, or broil some hamburgers or some fish. So they would base their runs of hamburger and hot dog rolls based on the forecast. Because if it was dry that night and people bought a lot of them, if it rained Saturday and Sunday, that was immaterial really to the company. They felt sorry for the people who had bought all the rolls, but the, the people had the rolls, not the bakery, not the stores. Mm -hmm. And so if you could do that accurately, that was important. Also for freezes and things like that in Florida or Texas, if it was going to be going below freezing, there would be ways of protecting the crops by doing some spray irrigation or whatever uh, to keep the cold air from settling at ground level right in the middle of the, the grove. So looking at those things, and today there are so, so many things are computerized mm -hmm. that, for example, let's say you're a, a trucking company. Um, you know what the time between all your routes are. Let's say there's going to be a storm along one of the routes. Mm -hmm. They can change what loads they're putting on different trucks and change the timing 
just like that, so the, the routes are still operating. And, and companies do this all the time, but they may not realize that a weather forecast can be tailored to that that closely. So the whole aim of it was to make people's lives easier in different walks of life, in different, in different sorts of businesses and different career professions. That's right. Have you ever considered uh, sales? Me? Yeah. <laughs> no. That sold me. <laughs> <laughs> We were talking about the, um, you know, you'll miss working with the people. Is there any advice that you have for uh, newer forecasters or kids listening who want to get into meteorology? For kids wanting to get into meteorology, concentrate a lot on the math and physics. Because whether or not, if you're a practitioner in the field uh, doing forecasts, you may not use that every day, but you have Mm -hmm. to do it it well enough to get through the curriculum in college. And so you may as well do as best as you can. And also uh, learn to speak and write well, because that's important just about Mm -hmm. anything you will go into. Mm -hmm. And get along with people. If you don't get along with people and and can't be a positive influence, who wants to work with you? Exactly. So that that kind of thing. And in the job, just pay attention to the people who are training you and try to do the best you can with the assignments you have. And pretty soon you're going to see that there are other opportunities, maybe I'm good at forecasting for California. Maybe I'm really good in talking to somebody about what's going to happen at their location so they make better decisions. And I go to the, maybe my supervisor and I say, I, I'd like to take a, a shot at doing this kind of thing. Maybe I'd even like to broadcast for the radio or, or be on TV. Mm-hmm. So the opportunities are there. And sometimes you have to ask for them because, I mean, imagine you're making a schedule for 100 people. Sure. The easiest thing to do is make a copy of last week's schedule right. and put it out again. <laughs> yeah. That may not be the easiest for the new worker who mm-hmm. wants to advance. I'd like to do this. But when the manager hears that, okay, let's give this a try. Let's discuss it among ourselves and see if this person can do it and then evaluate them. And, uh, can you uh, do s- certain tests and evaluate? If people want to do a radio broadcast, they, they interview with you and you hear what they have to say and they present information. In fact, every applicant for forecasting in AccuWeather sends in a recording of themselves and also a written weather summary. And historically, I've been the one grading those. I have no idea. I haven't met the person, so I'm not in the interview process. So it's like a a different source of information. And then I pass it on to Dave Dombeck, who is our manager of of forecaster hiring Mm -hmm. and i get those audio (laughs) so it's the same way it's a that's all you're getting is the audio so that's that's basically all you're getting if somebody isn't paying attention to what they're saying Mm -hmm. or it doesn't make any sense like snow tomorrow will accumulate four to six inches high 47 i'm thinking about wait a minute that's not going to happen they realize (laughs) that 47 is 15 degrees above freezing it's not going to stick yeah Mm -hmm. yeah now if they say high tomorrow 47 but when it's snowing in the morning it'll be 32 then, I, okay, here's somebody that thought this through. Mm-hmm. You just didn't read the high for the, high for the day, o- offered different information. And it sounds subtle. They might have predicted the exact same number for the high, but by adding that other information, they showed that they knew what was happening. It's all about the communication. That's right. And also the way they talk, speak, and... <laughs> <laughs> yes. You were asking before about some of the things in the early days, and since there were no big computers there were base computers but there weren't personal computers Mm -hmm. and so how did we get radar information for example when I'd be in a radio booth and I wanted to see the radar we had these little fax machines and the fax machines printed out pieces of paper that weren't much bigger than post-it notes of of, of the radar of the radar wow and they came out of the machine took only a few minutes to get one but you had to dial them up independently and we also had regional maps because we had to plot these maps. And there was actually a job title at AccuWeather called Map Plotter. Wow. You had to plot one of these maps in about a half an hour. If you've never done it before, reading and decoding all the information and, ri- and plotting it neatly might take you two hours. But the really fast ones could get it down below a half an hour. Now, today, the computer does in a few seconds. But with the radar, we had those blank maps sitting there. And so I was thought, well, why don't we put these like post-it note radars over the places where the radar sites are? And so you soon had a mosaic of what was happening. Nothing was moving. There's no video in this. Wow. But you could see, okay, here are these big thunderstorms about here in the Ohio Valley, and here it's clear. And then an hour or two later, you see how far the thunderstorms had gone, 
and you can begin to say, okay, these are going to get to Pittsburgh at 5 in the afternoon. They might get to Harrisburg at 8 in the evening, and so you, you can do it that way. But it was all done with pieces of paper. Just little pieces of paper just to make this big puzzle. It, 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 I, take, I take using my computer and checking the radar and stuff that we have internally – it, it, so much for granted with with what we do here now, but I couldn't imagine you know using that as just a basis of information. And today with the radar, you can actually tell the difference between the snow and rain areas mm -hmm. by the colors, yeah. color scheme, and can see uh, debris fields caused by tornadoes. This is a lot of this is has to be just in its infancy because when you look at how much we've come in the last fifty years in terms of the technology and getting information out. Mm -hmm. It can only get larger, and there can only be more opportunity for people to help do that. Now, as you're, uh, you know, you've got a couple of weeks left here at AccuWeather before you retire, do you, do you think about your legacy at all, or what you want it to be, hope to be? Not too much. Just hope that people were glad they worked with me, and, and uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, well, I can tell you, you know, I've had the privilege of working with you, uh, what, 11, 12 years now, right. I think. Same and year. I've uh, been able to uh, learn a lot from you, especially on the radio very, side. You're always very quick to try to, you're always interested in making our product the best, explaining to people how to do this. I try. <laughs> no, and, and, and when we have to be told that something was wrong, uh, being direct about it. And that's the way it should be. You should know where you stand at any time, and I have always felt that way. Well, I can say, and I think Andy has the same kind of story. I grew up in Philadelphia, so I grew up listening to you. Oh, my uh, <laughs> No, I, I always say you were either my, you know, my favorite person or my least favorite person, especially when it came to a snow forecast, because that, I, <laughs> that could if be. If I predicted snow turned into rain, there were thousands. Thousands of kids that were mad at me because <laughs> I made it that way. Yep, it was always I mean, your I, fault. I once got a threatening letter from somebody. This was really? before these things became common that they were going to get me, and it was because I'd predicted snow turning to rain. And that meant school the next and day. And so I, I learned from that is when I make a forecast, even today on the radio, mm -hmm. I'll say, we expect it to snow tomorrow, and it could be icy in the morning, but kids do your homework. It might turn to rain early. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good advice. <laughs> and that I, I got to say, too, as well, going off of what Ken was saying, that was the first time that I was uh, experienced, you know, that I that I got to hear you was when I was a kid, and I listened to you on Philadelphia radio, you know, talking about the snow and, you know, when my school was going to be closed and, you know, just to, the fact that, like, I got to come here and, and, and get to work with you and be around you, and, and now, like, <laughs> here I am eight years later, I'm sitting across the table from you. <laughs> <laughs> head swelling. It's it, it it really is remarkable, and you know to just to just be here and to be speaking with you to learn about about your career and how much that you've contributed not only to not only to AccuWeather as a company, not only to forecasting, but also you know from from somebody that's a broadcaster to radio broadcasting. It's just it's it's incredible. Well, I appreciate that. I felt that way about some of the people. I work with one of my first part-time jobs was at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, and they had a weather station. And the person that ran it at the time was, was a meteorologist named Wally Canan. He was one of the first independent forecasters on TV. He didn't just read the take the official line of the forecast, but he said, "I think this storm is going to do that, or it looks to me like it's strengthening, something like that." And that seemed to be a good approach. And he ran the Franklin Institute thing. And so when I met him, I said, "Oh." <laughs> revered person like I can't believe I'm actually wow. getting to meet this person let yeah. alone working in the mm -hmm. same building well we both had that same kind of yeah. experience here uh, with you yeah. um, and, and I think the the good news I think for us though is that while you're stepping away full time to retire you're still going to actually still be hanging around here at AccuWeather for a little bit right? I expect to be working part time I haven't really been we've talked about some of the things mm -hmm. I could do such as being on the forecast floor and offering advice about storms. So still being able happening. to mentor and, uh, the newer and meteorologists. Just basically helping things out might fill in for some people. Fanta uh, it's great news to hear that you're still going to be sticking around just a little bit and we'll get to see you. Well, I hope yeah. to because, I mean, they say that getting older is like a, a small roll of uh, toilet paper. It goes faster and faster and gets smaller and smaller, and I just hope mine doesn't get that small or that fast <laughs> that quickly. <laughs> well, um, congratulations on yeah. a tremendous career, and thank you so much for uh, taking some time to sit down with us here on the podcast this week. Well, and I thank you because, um, as I might have imagined, there are really only two people who have wanted to do this so far. <laughs> <laughs> You and Andy and, and <laughs> Regina. Regina would have. And, and Regina yeah. happened, yeah. just happened to be off today. Yep, yep. She's fantastic. 
but I mean, I'm I'm honored by this. I mean, I really truly am, and and it's great. And there's some people over here that are taking our pictures and recording all this, and they'll have to splice it up and try to make some sense out of it. I appreciate, <laughs> I, I appreciate them too. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Elliot. And good luck with everything. You're welcome. Have the best day you've ever had until tomorrow. You too. And sincerely, from from us here at the podcast, but from you know everybody here at AccuWeather, our big thanks to you know our friend, our colleague Elliot Abrams for sitting down with us and talking about his career. It's going to be weird not having him around here every day. Well, like you said, he is actually still going to be hanging around mm-hmm. in, in a part-time capacity. And actually, I think we already got him lined up for another podcast coming up in March. Yeah, so. yeah, he's already asking us about <laughs> you know future appearances. So yeah, we'll have more with Elliot. And uh, a big thanks to him for for a great career here at AccuWeather. And uh, next week, well, Regina Miller is going to be back. And another special guest as well. We are going to be joined with not only uh, Dave Dombeck, who's been on the show plenty of times, but we're going to be joined by WPVI in Philadelphia's chief meteorologist, Cecily Tynan, is going to be talking about how the business has changed in the Philadelphia market and what their partnership with AccuWeather means. Yep, and that's coming up next week, so make sure you tune in. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to AccuWeather's Everything Under the Sun, giving you the stories behind the weather and so much more. New episodes every Thursday. Just search for AccuWeather on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or visit accuweather.com slash podcast.